Hello everyone! Today we are looking at the second part of the series on the rise of totalitarian regimes. And we're starting off with Tsar Nicholas II. He becomes Tsar in the late 1800s uh, and he is determined to rule with complete control. He doesn't want to surrender any of his power and he wants to be a strong centralized leader. And along with this, he's looking out outside of Russia and he's seeing the progress and great strides that the other European nations are making as far as industry and building and modernization is concerned and the benefits that it is bringing to their countries. And so he makes a firm attempt to modernize his country as well. He also adopts a more uh, Western European style of dress and changes a lot of what is popular in the culture and society in, in, in Russia. Now, at this time, his focus is big business and industrialization. And along with that comes the same problems that industrializa industrialization brought many other countries, um, especially with common labor, the common people, the majority of people, you know, 98% or so, they're working long hours and unsafe conditions, barely have enough to live on. Many are living in the factories that they work in. And so Tsar Nicholas II here is, is a divisive figure because in one hand, it, he's seen as trying to do the best for his country to you know, modernize them and, and bring them into, into the modern world. But at the same time, nothing is being done for the, the, the common person. Now, you could argue that that was the same way in other industrialized nations at the time, and you'd be right. Um, but those nations ended up handling this problem differently than the Russians end up handling it. Okay? revolution here. Okay, so leaders begin to organize in secret to plot to overthrow the Tsar. The largest of the revolutionary groups is the Marxists following, following Marx, and they split into two competing groups. One is the Mensheviks, who were cautious and wanted the majority of people behind them. So they're looking for pop, popular the popular vote, essentially, um, based on the majority of people who are backing them in order to move against the government. The Bolsheviks want action now. They're not going to wait until they have the majority of people supporting them. They're just going to go over and, and take over the government, essentially. And the leader of that group is named Vladimir Lenin. And yes, it is that Vladimir Lenin who ends up becoming the leader of the Soviet Union. Lenin's a great organizer, but also very ruthless. And his ruthlessness is fairly characteristic of Soviet leaders uh, to, that, that, that follow him, quite frankly, okay? You have Lenin, some propaganda from Soviet Russia, where he's, you know, strong in, in, con in, in contrast, okay? The Russo-Japanese War. Now, this is a war that happens prior to World War I and really sets the stage for why Russia engages in World War I like they did. In the late 1800s, Russia and Japanese clashes. They clash over who would control the Korean Peninsula in northern China. They sign a series of treaties. Russia breaks these treaties, and in retaliation, Japan attacks Russia. Now, at this time, Europeans kind of thought themselves as like, greatly dominant and superior, especially militarily, over any other people group on the planet. It's a fairly racist thing, and they thought they would just dominate in, in, this, in this war. Uh, Japan, actually, though, does a pretty good job of just winning battle after battle after battle, and it humiliates the Russians. Not only is it the Tsar, but the nation of Russia is then being looked at as weak by the other European nations. And so, I mean, when Theodore Roosevelt offers to mediate after the, 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 the war ends, I mean, this is a, uh, 
it's a very, very embarrassing thing for Russia, and it's one of the reasons why they become so aggressive at the beginning of World War I, and after this war, continue to industrialize and build up their, their, their military, okay? So we're looking at this area here, okay? So Siege of Port Arthur, and then a series of other battles, and yeah, the, the Japanese are winning the majority of this. Okay. Got Roosevelt stepping in between the Tsar and the Emperor, saying, let's have peace there. The Russian Revolution of 1905, uh, the war, the cost of the war made conditions in Russians even worse for the, for the workers. Sorry, the Revolution of 1905. Uh, January 22nd, 1905, 200,000 of them and their families marched on the Tsar's palace in St. Petersburg. They carry a petition asking for better working conditions, more freedom, and an elective legislature. A Duma is what it, it ends up being called uh, in, in, in Russia. So in the United States, we have Congress. In Britain, you have Parliament. In Russia, they have the Duma. Nicholas II is not at this, the palace at the time. His soldiers were, they ended up firing into the crowd. Now, if you know anything about world history, firing into a crowd of protesters is a good way to create martyrs in the media and incite more revolt and rebellion. They kill between 500 and 1,000 people so it wasn't like a couple shots are fired into the crowd and one or two people die and then it's blown out of proportion. No, a significant number of people die. And they named this event Bloody Sunday and turned against the Tsar. So Bloody Sunday set off waves of strike and violence across, Ru across Russia. Nicholas, to try to calm it down, allows the people to have a Duma or a parliament. Nicholas, not liking the way it's going, closes it down just weeks later. But there is a precedent set for some version of constitutional monarchy or, you know, a democratic uh, democracy within the Tsarist's Russia. Okay, here's Bloody Sunday. I mean, interesting thing to know. You've got Let's go back to this real quick. Okay, so you've got the soldiers who are falling on and killing. You've got the priest who is leading the way and in support of the people. You've got like women and children cowering and elder women, children, and elderly being slaughtered by the soldiers. And the only the one of the only able-bodied men who would be of like fighting age at the time is standing here in the center you know a little off center but but he's kind of the focus of the painting giving access to his heart basically he is saying you know i am peaceful take my heart if if, if you want it he, in other words he is not fighting back he's not provo providing any resistance and so this is a painting depicting evil, the evil Tsar and his uh, and his soldiers. Uh, art is very interesting in that it is a window into the thoughts and ideas of a time period. Russia and the and World War One. So Nicholas II, he's building up this large military and decides to bring Russia into World War I at the very, very beginning. Russia is unprepared militarily and economically for this, but they've been gearing up since the uh, Russo-Japanese War. Okay, And just as in the Russo-Japanese War, they faced defeat, again, defeat after defeat against the Russian, uh, against the German, uh, yeah, against the Germans, um, you know, they are being defeated over and over again. After one year of war, Russia had lost four million men. The, the numbers in World War I are just staggering and horrifying. 
uh, Nicholas moves his headquarters to the battle zone to oversee the fighting. So he leaves the capital where that is his center of power and he moves away from his nexus of power in a time when there's a lot of contention within his government and with his people. And he leaves his wife in charge, uh, Alexandra uh, Fedorovna, I believe is how it's pr pronounced. And she ignores all of the chief advisors and instead relies on this mystic named Rasputin. Now, Rasputin is one of those figures in history that should have never had power, but did. Um, he's like this sorcerer who uh, the queen relies on, you know, as a healer and advisor, and she he basically takes center stage and starts orchestrating government uh, through the queen. In 1916, a group of nobles end up murdering her. Rasputin. Uh, they were terrified of him. They poisoned him, they shot him, and then they threw him into a freezing river way down because they thought he would come back to life and, and kill him. And, and kill him. Um, he, was a, he was a terrifying in, in, individual. Um, there's a picture of him coming up, and it's really the look in his eyes that gets people. I mean, without having any contact with the person, even you know, a picture over a hundred years later, it really, really gets to you. You don't see what I mean. Meanwhile, the soldiers were beginning to mutiny. Now, here's the uh, Zarina, I believe is what it's the, the, the title is. Okay, and then you have Rasputin, and it's just those eyes. Stalin's rise to power. Okay. Lenin ends up taking over. Okay. Stalin. Whoa. I think this is out of order. Eh. Let's keep going. Lenin ends up to taking over after a, a brief democracy. We'll actually get back to that for sure. And then... Lenin dies. Stalin ta takes over. And there's a power struggle for the Communist Party and the con country. Leon Trotsky and Stalin were Lenin's supporters while he was alive and had helped restore Russia. After Lenin dies, these men become bitter rivals for the control of Russia. Stalin's original name is one I cannot pronounce. Uh, he changed his name to Stalin, which is Russian for Man of Steel. I'm kind of like Superman, but he's not Superman. Uh, the name hit fit for him very well because, unlike Superman, he is cold, hard, ruthless, and impersonal. Lenin, while uh, alive, never trusted Stalin, nor should he have, and considered him dangerous, which he absolutely was. From 1922 to 29, Stalin begins gathering power and controlling, uh, and, and you know, pulling more control into his hands. And by 1929, he's in complete control of the Communist Party. Party, Trotsky is forced to leave the country, and Stalin becomes the absolute dictator. And Stalin is one of the most infamous, infamous men in human history. Um, Hitler kills a lot of people after he rises to power through his concentration camps. Um, Stalin killed a lot more of his, his people through the Gulag system. Okay. The March Revolution. That we, we were kind of getting ahead of ourselves there. The March Revolution. March 1917. Women textile fabric workers begin a strike in Petrograd. Soon after, riots erupted over shortages of bread and heating fuel. The soldiers, instead of shooting them, end up joining them. Soon the whole country called for the overthrow of the Tsar. So this is prior to Stalin taking over. That slide was out of place. I apologize for that. Uh, Nicholas II, forced to abdicate, stepped down. The Romanov family is taken prisoner, and a year later, they're executed. Okay. And this is one of those symbolic things that is done in countries with monarchs, is the statues that are built of them are toppled after they, after they lose power.
Okay, the Bolshevik Revolution. The Duma, or like the parliament, forms a government after the Tsar leaves. Okay, so the first government that forms in Russia after the fall of the Tsar and his, his family is actually a democracy. A Duma is, the Duma is formed as a temporary government based on democracy, and the leader is Alexander Karnesky. He made a huge mistake, though. Instead of just abandoning the war and pulling out, he decides to continue World War I with Germany. The people turn against him. His government falls from power in less than two months. So democracy was short-lived in Russia. Soviets take over. Uh, Soviet, Soviets were councils consisting of factory workers, peasants, and soldiers. Uh, the symbol for the Soviet Union, the hammer and the sickle, are representative of farmers and like factory working class people. That's, that's what that symbology is. They soon backed the Marxist leaders, especially Lenin, Lenin and the Bolsheviks were sweeping into power. And in November of 1917, without warning, the armed factory workers called Red Guards stormed the provincial government. The Democratic leaders disappeared. Okay, this is Alexander Karnesky. He's a soldier. Lenin. The Red Army. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is my third take doing this video. <laughs> so, short on... Short on the, vocal cords right now. Lenin is in power. He orders all farmland to be distributed among the peasants, which is wildly popular until it ends up rolling out that uh, they don't get to uh, own any of it. All factories would be under the control of the workers, which ends up being in control of the state. Peace was to be made with Germany at a huge cost to Russian territory. And so in order to just leave the war, there are repercussions for that. Germany ends up gaining a lot of, you know, what had been formerly Russian territory. And the people are angry over this. So they turn against the Bolsheviks who had come into power. So they're angry at Alexander Kornesky for continuing the war. And now they're angry at Lenin and the Bolsheviks for leaving the war. Which leads to the Russian Civil War from 1918 to 1920. This was absolutely devastating. Those opposed to the Bolsheviks formed the White Army to oppose the Soviet Red Army. Okay, Leon Trotsky commands the Bolshevik armies. Many other nations sent aid and soldiers to aid the White Army, including the United States, because the hardline Bolsheviks, communist Bolsheviks are in direct opposition to the ideology of capitalist Western society. The Russians never forgot that we invaded them, and they were never happy that we supported the White Army. And it destroyed trust between the United States and the, and the Soviets, and they resented that we wanted them to stay at war with Germany. Our relationship with Russia was poisons for decades to come, and Russia loses more people after World War I than during the whole war. They lost 1,700,000 1, uh, soldiers in the war, uh, another 2.3 to starvation. During three years of civil war, Russia lost 15 million due to fighting starvation and the flu epidemic. Uh, the flu epidemic we're talking about is the Spanish flu that just ravages Russia. Uh, and Russia is absolutely devastated. You've got Trotsky here. Okay. Uh, these are people begging officials for aid um, because they're starving. That's kind of what I mean when I say that this was absolutely horrible. 
It really, really was. Um, those pictures I just showed kind of speak for themselves. Okay, so Lenin ends up restoring order. Lenin's top priority is getting people fed. He allows farmers to sell all of their surplus fruit, food at a profit for a time being. Originally, he's like, profits are evil. You, you know, it's all for the state. But they allow the people to do it because people are literally starving. And as soon as they, like, allow the free market to come back even a little bit, the, like, the food shortages go away. It's really amazing. Uh, most banks and factories stayed under governmental control. Lenin split, split the country into self-governing republics in 1922. And Russia now becomes the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. They're still under control of Moscow, the new capital. The Bolsheviks rename the party the Communist Party. And under the teachings of Marx, the people are supposed to have all the power. But in reality, Lenin and the party leaders rule with an iron fist. Uh, so you end up having one di dictator felled only for a worse dictator to pick up in their place. Under Lenin's leadership, Russia slowly recovers, though. And in 1928, Russian factories and farms were producing as much as they had before World War I. But he did not live to see the recovery. Uh, he has several strokes, which paralyze him, and died in 1924. And that leads to, you know, Stalin's takeover. Turn back on this other slide. Yeah. So this was out of order, and I apologize for that. Okay, so Len, after Lenin dies, there's a struggle for, for control. Saul and Trotsky are at odds, and he names himself the Man of Steel. He takes complete control of the Communist Party, and Trotsky, who was instrumental in winning the Russian Revolution, ends up taking over, and Stalin becomes an absolute dictator. Now, back to where we were. Okay, Stalin builds a totalitarian state. It's a, a totalitarian is a, uh, is a term for governmental control, where they control every aspect of public and private life. Uh, classic, this clashes with the democratic ideals of you know, freedom, human dignity, human value, and other totalitarian nations begin to emerge. Hitler and the Nazi party are the first one. Now, I'm not going to get into the Nazi party in this slideshow and in this unit. We're going to save that for the next one on World War II. Just letting you know that it's part of this and it is coming. Mussolini comes to power in Italy in 1922. Also a fascist like Hitler also will be covered in World War II. And then Mao Zedong took, takes control of China in 1949. North Korea has been under two brutal dictators since 1940. 48, father and son. Okay, and this is kind of the result of communism for a lot of people. You've got these horrible prisons in the Soviet Union called the Gulag, where people are sent by the millions to die in work prison camps, and it was just absolutely devastating conditions where they're turning big rocks into little rocks until they die. I mean, and I. I've said that as a joke in the past, but it's really not a joke, okay? And I realize this might not be in Russia, but I mean, that's, you, you get the idea. Okay, China. During World War I, so we're, we're shifting away from Russia now, we're talking about China. And during World War I, China for years had faced humiliation for, from the Europe. The Europeans uh, being bullied and, and forced to do things against their will. Other nations divided China into re regions under their control. Germany controls one section, the British, French, and Portuguese, Japanese control another re region, and they are labeled the sick man of Asia. In 1912, China's last emperor is overthrown, and throughout World War I, China is in chaos and remains divided. Pillaging and looting from rival armies and warlords is constant, and China is in a state of chaos, essentially. 
disrupted food supplies, caused millions to die from star starvation. And then with, then with the Treaty of Versailles, as World War I ends, China hopes to gain a little bit more stability and control. Second. The Europeans wanted China to remain divided into spheres of influence. The U.S. was opposed to this and wanted China to be free. It's ironic that America today is so at odds with China when back at this time we were more of an ally. Okay? And so you've got China being depicted here as you know being trampled and torn apart by all these other factions. In the 20s and 30s, new democratic leader comes into power, uh, a leader named, oh, I'm going to mispronounce this and I apologize, uh, Sun uh, uh, Xinjiang, Xinjiang? I, I, I apologize, my pronunciation of, of ch Chinese is absolutely abysmal, uh, managed to unite southern China. He formed the uh, Kuomintang or Nationalist Party. He wanted three basic th things. One, the end of foreign occupation, democracy, and economic security. So in other words, we want to control ourselves in a, with a democracy and make sure our economy is stable. I mean, as far as goals for a nation are concerned, these are pretty good ones. <laughs> I can't think of any other democratic state that doesn't have these same wants and desires. The Europeans did not support this democracy because uh, uh, Zin, Zin, he wanted them out of China. I apologize. I, I need to look that up later. Uh, Marxism enters China. Lenin made friends with China and gave them what support he could. So here's the thing. America has this this opportunity. Had they, you know, supported the, the you know the Nationalist Party that, that is coming into play, things might have played a little different. Though Nationalist parties like the fascists in uh, in in Europe made things way worse. However, they they weren't voting for a uh, nationalist who would rule as a dictator. They were looking for a democratic state, so things might have gone differently in China. However, it wasn't to be because Marxism and enters China. Lenin makes, makes friends with China, gives them what support he could. Soon a communist party is gaining strength in China, and uh, Sun dies in 1925. And soon after, the nationalists and communists are fighting for control of China. By 1927, the nationalists had all but destroyed the communists under the leadership of uh, Zheng Qishai, uh, I believe is how it's pronounced, also known as uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And this is uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, this is, sorry, that's Sun. This is Chiang, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Last chance for democracy in China, uh, Zheng Jishi soon proved to be greedy and corrupt. Zheng had promised freedom for all the Chinese people, helped modernize Chinese cities, but did nothing for the country's peasants. And so the, this is where co the communist ideology once again comes in. As a result, the almost extinguished communists soon began to become strong and spread throughout the countryside as people, the majority of the people, are poor and their living conditions are not improving. Communist leader is Mao Zedong, and he organized the rural, rural areas of China under communism and forms the Red Army. By 1930, the communists and nationalists were fighting a bloody civil war. And in the long march by 1933, Zhang gathered an enormous army of over 700,000, surround the mountain strongholds of the communists, and the communists are outnumbered six to one and choose to flee rather than face certain defeat. So in 1934, they began a hazardous 6,000 mile march that lasted for a whole year. And they're usually just one step ahead of Zhang's forces. Okay, so here you see Mao. 
and this is the Long March. The Major Command and the Minor Commands who are also fleeing. Okay, and then you have the Japanese invasion. As the Chinese Civil War raged, Japan watches on with growing in interest and they take advantage of some Chinese weakening situation to invade northern China, an area called Manchuria. The attack was the official beginning of World War II in Asia. And let me just tell you, the way that the Japanese treated the Chinese during this invasion was absolutely horrifying. Um, there was an incident called the Rape of Nanking that uh, it's something that I'm not going to go into and on YouTube. Um, I don't know too much about it myself because every time I've done research on it, I have been so horrified that um, it's one of those things that it's so painful to look at and research that I try to stay away from it. it uh, there's very few things in human history that have happened that have been as bad as the invasion of Manchuria and what happened in Nanking. Um, if you are interested, go ahead and research this this on your own. But just the, the brutality and um, lack of human dignity that was... I mean, I, 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 words can't describe it. In 1937, Japan, Japan invaded the rest of China, dropped bombs on Chinese cities without regard to military uh, targets, results in the death of thousands of Chinese citizens. Japan destroyed uh, Chinese farms, which results in mass starvation across the, the nation. And by 1938, Japan holds most of coastal China, but couldn't reach the inland areas. China is huge. It's absolutely enormous. Okay, so. This is the Japanese occupation. But the much great, great majority of people that live in China live in this area. So they have the majority of the populated zones um, that they've taken care of. Like this whole area here is one giant desert. Um, this is, you know, very, very mountainous region. There's not nearly as many people here. And then in this inland area, it's very far removed from, you know, coastal cities and, and, and trading, so there are not nearly as many people there. So the great majority of people who live in China are in these coastal regions, even today. On October 1st, 1949, China's leader Mao Zedong declares the creation of the People's Republic of China, the PRC, Full-scale civil war breaks out between the communists and the nationalists after the end of World War II. The announcement ends the costly civil war between the Chinese, you know, CCP, the Communist Party, and the Nationalist Party, or KMT. The creation of the PRC also completed the long process of governmental upheaval in China and begins the Chinese Revolution that was begun by the Chinese Revolution in 1911. So from 1911 to 19. 45, essentially, you've cut war in China, which is just crazy. Uh, and then before that, you have states of chaos and, and, and unrest. The fall of mainland China to communism in 1949 leads the United States to suspend diplomatic ties with the PRC for decades because we are very, very ideologically opposed to communism in Western, um, you know, American democratic society. Okay. Uh, two civil wars, 45 to 49, you've got area controlled by the communists in 46, and, you know, by 49, and then by 50, and then, you know, they're finally, you know, winning the rest. And it, this is interesting, area controlled by Kumtang after 1950, this is why Taiwan still claims essentially independence, and China claims that it's theirs and it's a big thing. And 
that is the end of this presentation um, to be continued with the rise of Nazi Germany and continuing this, this theme of totalitarian regimes in the uh, next setup. I realize this was a long video. Thank you so much if you stuck in and watched the entire thing. Ladies and gentlemen, have a fantastic day.